think you knew exactly what you were doing. We did it together. Another season of twists and turns and moral dilemmas has come to an end. Let's talk about Cruel Summer Season 2 and find out just what happened. <laughs> What's going on everyone, Lisa here, and the time has come to close the chapter on another season of Freeform show, Cruel Summer. Now, the mystery of who killed Luke Chambers has officially been solved, and let's just say it was a season that threw maybe too many red herrings at us, but I feel like ultimately a lot of you who watched along with me did guess the outcome, or the majority of the outcome, because, you know, they had one little final twist in there that really put the nail in the coffin. But extra high fives to you if you guessed both of the things that ultimately happened at the end of the episode, which we will of course talk about. And you'll love that in the finale we do get a shout out for season one so there is this fun easter egg and I'll talk about that when we get there. For those of you that have been watching along with me all season and you just want to get to my recap and thoughts about the final episode, the finale aka the ending, you can skip ahead using the time codes in the description or the chapter markings that are in like the time bar on this video. I'll also go over some things from the executive producer or the showrunner or what they said about the finale explaining a few other things but I do know however there are a lot of people who just like to wait for a season to be over and watch a recap instead of watching a whole show or those who are just curious you know to see how a show ends that they maybe didn't ultimately finish or people who just discover videos like this after they've gone and watched the season maybe later so for those people we're just gonna do kind of a brief recap of everything leading up to this final episode now obviously it's not going to be as detailed and you're not going to see so much of the push and pull of who who is it who is it as you would if you go back and watch every recap for each episode so if you want more in depth go do that otherwise here's kind of your brief sort of brief recap leading up to this final episode in three two one Okay, so this season takes place in a town called Chatham, small town in the Pacific Northwest, and we have our three main characters. Megan is a somewhat reserved smart girl who loves coding and is focused on getting a scholarship to college, which means she kind of has a some what some would call like a square personality, doesn't like to party, break the rules, anything like that. Now, her family is a typical blue-collar family. They might not be in the best financial spot, so she helps support the family, and that includes her sister and her uh, mom, Debbie. Now, Megan's lifelong best friend is Luke Chambers, his family is the complete opposite of Megan. He lost his mom in an accident years ago, and it's now just him, his brother Brent, and his dad Steve. Steve is a wealthy business developer who pretty much owns all the businesses and stuff in town. Think very well off and very entitled. Steve wants his sons to follow in his footsteps, but Luke wants to form his own path, and as you can imagine, he and Steve don't really get along. Then you have Isabella. Now, Megan's mom decides it would be a good idea to host an exchange student for Megan's senior year to help broaden her horizons, I guess you could say. And Isabella is the daughter of diplomats and is the complete opposite of Megan in that she's pretty adventurous, outgoing, and there's also some mystery to her, especially about how she ended up in Chatham. So just like in season one, the season takes place over three different timelines, but season two, it's not three different summers. It's instead the summer of 1999, the winter of 99, and the summer of 2000. But keeping in theme with season one, we do have the different color gradings and hairdos and such to tell you what timeline you're in. Ultimately, the season revolves around who killed Luke Chambers, and as you can imagine, Imagine all eyes turn to the girls, Megan and Isabella, but are they responsible? Because whenever you have a love triangle and such, it immediately becomes messy. Now Luke goes missing after leaving his New Year's Eve party and then his body is not found until months later in July 2000 and the pieces start to fall in place. So let's kick it off with the summer 99 timeline. When Isabella arrives in town, Megan's pretty cold to her because they are complete opposites, but Megan takes Isabella around and introduces her to her friends and such, including Luke and Luke and Isabella hit it off. Now it seems like Isabella notices there may be something going on with Megan and Luke as if they're more than friends, but Megan insists they're just lifelong friends and know each other too well for that to happen. So Isabella's just like, off the bat, can I hook up with Luke? And Megan's like, go for it. So she's barely been in town 24 hours, so you can see this girl knows what she wants and she's gonna go get it. But you can see that maybe Megan isn't as okay with this as she said she was. Now as the summer progresses, Isabella and Luke start dating and Megan and Isabella finally start to get close after what feels like a test from Isabella during a hangout with friends at Luke's family cabin. When the group plays Two Truths and a Lie, Isabella says that she sleepwalks and Megan and her mom saw Isabella sleepwalking in the yard almost naked and she's like, right Megan? And Megan knows this isn't true, but ends up backing Isabella up, you know, and it sort of sets the tone for their friendship. Kind of the how far are they willing to go to cover for each other, you'll hear loyalty, ride or die, such, um, 
a lot. Just like how much can you push the buttons to test the loyalties of each other. But this begins their bonding and soon they become thick as thieves and start getting into a bit of trouble as we see Megan let loose and take more risks as Isabella's rubbing off on her. Now Megan attempts to date Jeff. This is a guy who always has a video camera attached to his hand which makes him kind of shady throughout the season but he's had a crush on Megan forever. But in the end it turns out she has feelings for Luke and Isabella has picked up on this so Isabella breaks up with Luke. Megan calls it off with Jeff and Megan and Luke get together and it's kind of awkward but Isabella is cool with it until she realizes she now has to share her time with Megan because before they kind of did the thing where they all hang out together or Isabella and Megan would hang out you know like that or Isabella would hang out with Luke she was dating him and well you can just see that Isabella craves attention and relationships her parents basically are never around and just send her money to like solve problems and the only friend Isabella has ever mentioned is this old friend named Lisa who she still writes the letters to. So Isabella has really just latched on to Megan craving this family. So in that way the vibe is sort of similar to season one with the theme of the jealousy and whatnot but instead of how Jeanette wanted to be Kate and take over Kate's life, you know, like that. Isabella just wants Megan basically all to herself. It's that kind of an obsession. And as you can guess, like season one, they really want you to believe both girls are capable of committing whatever crime happened. Megan, because maybe she's not as much of a goody good as people have thought throughout the season, we learn that she has secrets like taking, uh, like, ADHD medicine or whatever to help her stay awake and get ahead in school and as time goes on she gets better at lying and hiding things and blowing people off and, and things like that. Isabella is just a little bit more in your face with her plotting and jealousy and manipulation but she's also so charming that she manages to pass it off and people are kind of blind to it. And a prime example of this is when her ex-boyfriend and her mysterious friend Lisa's brother Trevor arrives in town and kind of exposes some of her secrets by revealing that Isabella is basically taking on new likes and personalities um, based on where she is and who she's around because she wants to have these people like her and such. And that the previous winter Isabella you know, didn't just like leave her boarding school. She actually got too drunk at a club in Ibiza and arrested and Trevor bailed her out and Isabella got expelled from school. So that's the truth that they're going with. But you can see like in that scene, if you go back and watch it, that Trevor's just kind of like, uh, what? Kind of too stunned to really actually say the true truth, which we'll get to in a little bit bit. Because let's just say that whatever happened with Lisa uh, back in the day with Isabella is very, very shady as we find that Isabella fled uh, Abitha before the police could question her for whatever happened to Lisa. But even though Luke and Megan are spending more time alone together now that they're dating, they still hang out with Isabella. So like things are still okay, it seems like, as we come to a close of the summer timeline until we flash the winter 99 timeline where it just all starts to crumble. At first things are looking good because Megan ends up getting a scholarship to the college she wants to go to and by this time she and Isabella are super close, Ryder dies, and things with Luke are going well for Megan. Well, we also learn that Megan's mom Debbie not only works for Luke's dad Steve but those two are also now dating which is obviously awkward but money isn't bad for but money is bad for both of these families in this timeline as Megan's family is struggling to pay the bills you know with Debbie being sick and whatnot um, which is a thing that they really never touch on again for the most part except to tell you that this is the reason why Isabella stayed in town after she was supposed to leave. And then as for Steve, his latest business development deal isn't going so well so he's hoping that his annual Christmas party he can schmooze investors and get things back on track. But that party is where things really start to go wrong because instead of the Christmas movie that is supposed to play for all the guests in honor of C's late wife, a sex tape of Luke starts playing and it gets shut off before the girl's face can be seen. But everyone at first thinks it's Megan since she's dating Luke till they realize that there's a pink sweater, you know, on the bedpost or whatever. And it's the same sweater that Isabella is wearing at the party that night. So everyone jumps to conclusions that Isabella is on the tape with Luke and Luke cheated on Megan with Megan's best friend. But Steve is just more so upset because all he cares about is his reputation and money and stuff and this tape has basically ruined the family name and investors start to back out of this deal. Now Isabella basically becomes the pariah, the outcast of the town. It's like she's wearing a scarlet letter but there's a big secret going on. Ride or die, like I said, is the theme of this season. Loyalty, how far you'll go for someone you love. And while Isabella isn't the one on the tape, it is indeed 
Megan because the two end up sharing clothes so there was just you know people jump to conclusions but Isabella is willing to take that heat so Megan can keep her scholarship for college because she just wants Megan to have the best life but all the lying and secret keeping ends up kind of putting a lot of stress on their friendship as well as Megan's relationship with Luke they have no idea who made this tape or who leaked it and so blame just starts being thrown around the girls think it has to be Luke's skeezy brother, Brent, because they find out he indeed does film girls at that cabin and such. And Luke even tries to turn in Brent's tape collection to the police, but Steve, his dad, quickly shuts that down because he's holding something over the sheriff's head, just showing off how powerful and disgusting Steve is. Slowly, things start to get even worse for everyone as Megan starts taking on hacking jobs and stuff to make money for college and other things and whatnot from... And these jobs are coming from Luke's cabin neighbor, who is a guy named Ned, who's kind of like this recluse savant computer coder that, that Megan kind of looks up to, but seems super shady, and he thinks Y2K is going to end the world. But Megan's just really more focused on making money at this point than everything else, and she starts to blow off Luke and even Isabella. So at this event that they were all supposed to go to, the annual like polar plunge or whatever they call it in that town that winter, Luke actually makes a move on Isabella and kisses her, then goes running off to Megan so that he can be the first to say that Isabella put moves on him, causing the girls again to have like their 500th fight and falling out. And this eventually ends up with Luke missing after his Y2K party. So then we have the summer 2000 timeline where we see that Megan and Isabella are really no longer friends. After obviously many months, Luke's body is finally found and identified and Steve is now hellbent on finding out who murdered his son as it has learned that Luke not only had muscle relaxers in his system, but he had also been grazed by a bullet from a gun that belonged to Steve that is usually kept at the cabin. Well, the girls, well, the girls obviously become the main suspects because they kind of had this whole love triangle thing going on but also because these girls aren't good at laying low they just naturally act super shady i feel like and suspicious they once the body is found are like we got to get our story straight because everything so far like i said is pointing at them and it just becomes this battle of she said she said so for everything that the sheriff brings at them as he during this investigation they seem to have an answer for or try to like their fingerprints are on the gun uh, that match the bullet that grazed luke well both girls did target shooting at the cabin that we saw in the summer 1999 timeline when they were hanging out with the boys. So the sheriff then finds a letter from Luke with Megan's fingerprints on it that says, you know, Luke is running away and all of this. And Megan says, well, her fingerprints are on it because Luke left her that letter to deliver to Steve at a certain time. Then we have Isabella's backpack being found with money and stuff at the cabin. And Isabella says that that definitely wasn't her because she never went back to the cabin after that summer. So someone's trying to frame her. We learn that Isabella's friend, Lisa, actually did drown in Ibiza and Isabella was the last person to see Lisa and fled immediately after it happened. Trevor actually writes Megan a note and sends the articles and stuff after he hears what happened to Luke because he's like, this sounds just like what happened to my sister. So this just makes Isabella look even shadier and more guilty. But it's this endless game with the sheriff of just trying hard to pin stuff on them and it just never sticking. And Steve, he just wants it so bad to be pinned on like Isabella that he ends up hiring a pr private investigator. And after seeing that Megan is kind of shady and working with the guy Ned, that neighbor that he doesn't really like because those two have had beef and Ned's definitely not a fan of the Chambers family, Steve starts to be like, oh, well maybe Ned could be responsible for all of this as well. So basically no one's been able to just be like pinned down to being the main suspect of this crime so far. So then we have episodes 7, 8, and 9 where the full picture really starts to take shape. Up until then, it's just been like, okay, did the girls kill Luke out of jealousy? Did Luke actually run away? Maybe he's alive and came back and something happened? Or maybe, you know, there's some other plot going on. Well, let's just fill in those blanks now. So remember when I said that Luke lied to Megan about Isabella kissing him at the plunge and Megan immediately kind of believed Luke? Well, Megan is cold to Isabella because they've had many falling outs now throughout this season. But at the New Year's Eve party, the truth finally comes out when Megan asks Isabella in her weird passive aggressive roundabout way what happened at the plunge and Isabella gets upset with Megan saying, you should have just given me the benefit of the doubt because he kissed me and why didn't you ask me to clear this up and all this, you should trust me. And Isabella just 
goes off questioning Megan's loyalty to her as a friend. So then Megan goes to find Luke and overhears him bragging to his friends about the tape and how he made a move on Isabella and he's such a man just juggling both girls. He's such a ladies man and he's just preparing for when he goes off to college next year. So now Megan's even more pissed and goes to tell Isabella that she wants revenge so the girls make a plan. What is this plan? Megan gets Luke to leave the party, suggesting they go up to the cabin and, you know, have some alone time and maybe want to try out some new stuff. So Megan ends up tying Luke to the bed with a rope and he's, of course, very excited until he realizes that Isabella is there. She shows up and he, of course, starts to panic, realizing something is about to happen. They want him to confess to all his lies. Turns out Luke isn't this great guy everyone thought. They think he's trash just like his dad and brother now. So as collateral, they start filming Luke and get him to confess to all the things he's done. It eventually comes out that yes, Luke lied about Isabella kissing him, and he's also the one who did film the tape of him and Megan at the cabin, but he claims that he did not leak it. He just wanted it as a private thing that they could watch back again later. Obviously, typical excuse. He then tries to get in Megan's head and tells her how jealous and obsessed Isabella is with Megan and wanting to have her all to herself. And how Isabella's just always out to get him. And so it then becomes a battle of Isabella and Luke both trying to convince Megan the other one is, you know, the worst. But when Luke calls Isabella basically crazy and stuff, it pushes Isabella over the edge and she ends up grabbing the gun in the cabin and she is the one who does shoot at Luke. The bullet just ends up grazing his ear though. Now Isabella's like, oh, we gotta go now, and she leaves and takes the tape that was filming everything with her, and Megan sticks around for a little bit longer to tell Luke a big secret. She's actually pregnant, and well, Luke's main reaction is like, I can call my dad, he can fix this, and this is kind of just the last straw that pisses Megan off, and she leaves him tied up. So then you're like, well, how did Luke end up in this whole situation in the first place? Because he really did seem like a good guy all through that summer of 1999. Well, there is a whole episode dedicated to Luke's point of view, well, I feel like it kind of all just starts to like go downhill when Luke starts to lie to Megan. And that happens when he and Megan start to get together and Megan's just very excited to kind of be each other's first times, explore this new thing with each other, things that they've never done. And well, Luke leaves out the fact that like a week or so prior, he actually lost his V-card to Isabella. So he afterwards tells Isabella to not tell Megan. If they both just leave it out, she'll never find out or anything. Well, when he got tied up, that ends up coming out and that causes a lot of fighting between the two girls. Then we know that Luke's relationship with his dad isn't the greatest and it turns out that Luke doesn't want to go to Branson College and follow in the family business. Instead, Luke wants to go to the Coast Guard and Steve flips out about all this, learning this, and those two just keep fighting and Steve tells Luke to stop being an embarrassment to the family and also kind of blames Luke for his wife's death. So then with all that and also being made fun of and ribbed on by the guys all the time about not having the balls to do things with Megan and such. That's why he makes the tape. Luke ends up reaching his breaking point at the Christmas party and after another fight with his dad, that's when Luke goes and grabs the tape instead of, you know, playing the tape that's meant to play, which is a Christmas movie to honor his mom. That's when the uh, bad tape starts to play. And that just sets off the snowballing of events that lead to Luke's just getting worse. Now back to him being tied up on the bed though. After the girls leave and he's drugged from the muscle relaxers and the drink that they gave him, he's bleeding and stuff, but he manages to finally untie himself. And he puts on his clothes and makes his way outside and manages to get to the dock. And he pages somebody and that's where we pick up with this final episode. So let's dive in a little bit more into the finale. How does everything end? Well, this finale episode takes place on January 1st, 2000, and then August 2nd, 2000, as you know, the summer and winter timelines have now caught up with each other. We know everything. So who did Luke page at the end of episode nine? It seemed like in this show, having a pager was kind of a status symbol. So we really only saw Luke have one and then one of his other, you know, rich friends had one. So it would make sense that the person who shows up at the dock ends up being Brent, his brother, who arrived at 5 a.m. telling, you know, Luke, this was his good deed for the year to help him come home. And he gets up and we don't kind of see where they go next. Instead, we go to Steve waking up and finding puddles of water all over the house and being, ooh, what happened? So you have to think, did Brent actually help Luke home, right? Could Luke actually have disappeared, maybe faked to death? Well, the answer is no, because Steve ends up finding Brent soaked and crying in the kitchen. There's something I need to tell you. And that's when we see from the trailer that we got that Steve runs into the woods to the dock screaming Luke's name, looking around for him. 
Meanwhile, the girls have gone home, obviously after leaving Luke tied to the bed, and Megan is really feeling guilty. She wants to go back and check on Luke to make sure he's okay, while Isabella is just kind of like sticking to the, this boy got what he deserved, and honestly, he's the problem and got off easy. And they just kind of go back and forth with each other, fighting yet again over responsibility, loyalties, and such. Megan ultimately says that she's going to go back to check on Luke at eight in the morning, and if Isabella wants to join her, she can. They end up both going the next morning, and Luke is gone, so they go searching in the woods for him, screaming his name and stuff, but there's no luck. So they go home and Megan starts to put in calls to the 911 center, the hospitals, all that to see if anybody with his description has, you know, called in or brought, brought into the hospital, but there's been no luck. This just causes Megan to continue to spiral and panic as Isabella is just like, you know what, Luke's probably fine. He's just laying low. Isabella's then like, we need to destroy that tape. And she takes the tape because she says it makes us look bad. She has, you know, practice in destroying tapes because we did see her early in her season burn the sexy tape with Megan and uh, Luke on it. Now, when Megan said that their plan was stupid, we see like Isabella do this like double down on the whole Luke deserved it all side of things. I'm starting to forgive him. Everything that's happened over the past two weeks is his fault. And again, the blame starts flying between these girls, the talk of trust, the talk of loyalty and all of that. You lied to my face. I don't know how I'm ever gonna trust you again. And while you know how you have Isabella always kind of questioning Megan's loyalty, as soon as Megan questions Isabella's loyalty, Isabella's like, peace out. Then we go back to Brent and he's talking to Steve because neither of them have slept all night and Brent's just like, not the Brent that we've seen this whole series. He's no longer like the scumbag. This is a ki worried kid who's like, what are we going to do? And you're like, oh, well, what happened then? And then we have Steve saying they'll find a way to fix this because well, Steve always finds a way to fix things. He's not gonna let anything happen to his golden child, especially now that his other child is missing. And that's when you know that Brent had something to do with what ultimately happened to Luke. So I'll just say if you called that, especially in the last few episodes, high five. But of course, this is Cruel Summer. And like I said, it's never just that easy. So I've watched obviously a lot of SVU and Lifetime, the headlines movie and true crime stuff to know that when someone is guilty of something, they kind of overcompensate. And so you see that happening in this show. We saw it with Steve very much overcompensating and going after people a little maybe too hard, even though he is a grieving parent, so you would expect some of that, but he was just like going way, way too hard and wanting to pin things on Isabella so bad, him and Brent, that you could tell something was a little fishy. And with Megan, we have her also just kind of being like, ooh, Isabella telling her to, you know, play the part of like the grieving girlfriend, and we have Megan putting up missing flyers and all of this, and all everybody just acting like they don't know anything. But then we have Steve coming over to talk to Megan to ask if she knows anything. And, you know, he obviously is pretending like he doesn't know anything while she is also pretending like she doesn't know anything. But we have Steve really starting to plant his plan by telling Megan that the sheriff has already started the investigation and hopes to get answers quickly and just hopes that Luke comes home soon. So, yeah, now we're thinking that the police are going to you know, find everything out. Megan and Isabella kind of start to panic and fighting over things again about who is to blame for what part of what happened to Luke. You're the most selfish person I've ever met. Yeah, I came up with that plan to help you. You want to take it back at Luke, not me. No, you did all this because you're addicted to drama. You're only happy when I'm miserable. Well, congratulations. You got what you wanted. I wish I never met you. We then switch over to our summer 2000 timeline where we have Steve again pushing extra hard for the sheriff to press charges. And like I said before, Steve is really going all out to just get this case put in the ground and behind him. And now knowing what we know in this episode, we know why he's pushing so hard. The sheriff, I gotta give him credit for handling Steve as much as he has. So he's, the sheriff is just kind of like, we just got tapes in our possession from Ned's computers. Ned, the neighbor at the cabin who is like very paranoid that I've mentioned before. So he has cameras pointing in every direction in those woods, especially on the street. And they have those tapes now because they found Megan and Isabella in, Steve, er, in Ned's house at that time. And so they brought all the tapes and they just have to like decrypt them and everything. But he says, Sheriff says once they find out what's on those tapes, they'll let Steve know. But you can see that Steve is pretty worried about what they're going to find out on those tapes. So he kind of wants it to happen before they can even look at those tapes, like put somebody, you know, in jail for it. So then we get our Easter egg from season one. We see Megan has her keys sitting on top of this book. And whose book is it? It is Kate Wallace's book called The Out of the Basement, The Kate Wallace Story. Obviously, Kate was played by Olivia Holt in season one. So sh this show does exist in the same 
universe as expected and that's kind of a book I want to read even though I actually you know we've seen what happened in the season it'd still be a fun read right but as Megan picks up her keys Brent just walks into the house to check up on her and is asking all these questions and all this stuff being pretty nosy trying to get information so he can always stay like five steps ahead Megan then goes to see Isabella and it turns out that we actually have been having the girls work together for a little bit they've been purposely accusing each other in front of the sheriff so that he can't really get a clear read on either of them or arrest one or the other. They also finally realized that, you know, hey, maybe we should actually try to check those security tapes that we were going to do in the first place because we know we didn't kill Luke, so whoever did is probably on them. So they hack into the deputy's computer and find the footage and they end up seeing Steve's car driving on the road in the footage a little bit after, you know, them. So what do they do? Instead of, you know, going to the police, they charge into Steve's office and just right out accuse him of lying and being out there and being at the cabin. And Steve lies and we have Brent eavesdropping looking like he's about to shit his pants. Steve then fires back at the girl saying that his private investigator talked to Trevor. You remember Isabella's ex-boyfriend, friend of Lisa's brother, and knows about what Isabella did there or at least like the, the questioning of what happened there and how Isabella's friends have a habit of dying. And Steve just tells Megan to watch her back hoping to pit these girls against each other but you can tell that Steve is also sharding in his pants just a little bit. So now the girls are like we got to figure out if it's really Steve on the tape because they all saw it was Steve's car but they couldn't really see who was in it. So probably something you should have done before rushing into this man's office right but these girls are really not thinking clearly we can tell that throughout the whole season they are acting on impulse and not out of actual like thinking logically. But Isabella brings up how it kind of felt like old times working together trying to build that friendship up again but when Megan just rejects and it's like no this was just desperation, not friendship. You wouldn't know loyalty if it bit you in the ass. I'll get myself home. Yeah, I honestly think that Isabella has just ruined the words ride or die, trust and loyalty for me. Like, at this point, I don't think she thinks it means what she thinks it really means. But then we have Brent going back to C's office, panicking, saying that it's over, they're gonna take him to prison, it's not you know, maybe it's not a bad thing. Hearing Lu Brent actually say maybe it's not a bad thing if I go to prison, I was actually kind of like impressed and happy about. But Steve is of course just like, get a hold of yourself, man, slaps him and says, this is gonna go away. So then after this, we have Megan sitting, reading an article and listening to the radio. Authorities say new evidence has come forward and an arrest may be imminent. An official statement from the Sheriff's Department is expected. But we have Megan again going to talk to Isabella to kind of like figure out their game plan. But the thing is, Isabella's already checked out of the place where she was staying, so that was an error I made in my last uh, previous video. I thought that Isabella was staying with uh, her friend Parker because that's what she had said, but she was actually just staying at a hotel and Parker had come over to that hotel and eavesdropped and heard things that she told the sheriff. But anyway, so Isabella is gone. It looked like Megan questioning again, saying that they weren't friends. It was out of desperation and the loyalty thing was like Isabella's last straw and she has bolted. But uh, you know what? She's been scorned enough that she left behind something for Megan, a little special present as we see that Megan gets pulled over and arrested by the sheriff for Luke's murder. And it's kind of like, why? Well, somehow the sheriff has again been handed a piece of, you know, important evidence, which is the tape from the night of New Year's at the cabin that Isabella was supposed to destroy. But instead, this is a tape that's been edited to only show Luke screaming, you shot me with Megan holding the gun and Isabella nowhere on the tape. And yep, handcuffs go straight on Megan and Megan is pleading that this is not me, this is not what happened on the tape, but you know what? The sheriff's got his hands tied because this is the tape that he has. Yeah, and you can bet who left that tape and fled. The girl who preached all season about loyalty, Isabella. She's loyal until you make her mad and question her loyalty. We had examples of that all season, like when Isabella promised to keep the secret of Megan being the one on the tape because she just wanted Megan to succeed and, you know, Isabella was going to leave anyway, so she didn't care about the bad reputation she already had, until Isabella basically overheard Megan calling Luke her number one, ride or die, and all of this stuff, so Isabella then went and tattled about Megan actually being the one on a tape to Megan's mom, Debbie. Or you also have Isabella spying on Megan when Megan threw out the bloody sheets and then Isabella going to keep those bloody sheets. And again, when Megan said something to her that she didn't like, she went and told Debbie about the sheets. And probably other examples that if you go back and watch the season, you can pick up on. But yeah, so Megan getting arrested by the sheriff, trying to plead for her life that it's not her on a tape in the way that it's being shown. But we then have Steve getting informed that Megan's been arrested, so he tells 
Brent and you know, Brent is like, no. Brent, we've seen a different Brent in this episode. He's like, we can't do this. We can't pin this on an innocent person, especially not Megan because she is practically our family. We grew up with her. This can't be happening. And we know that all season Steve and Brent really wanted to pin it on Isabella. So yeah, having it be pinned on Megan is just like no for Brent. He's grown this conscience and he's just like, we got to fix this. But Steve, being the douchebag we've seen him be all season only cares about his name. He says that Megan does not bear the chamber's name and tells Brent life isn't fair and this is just how life works so to grow up and I oh I just hate that man so much and it's wild how good I know Paul Adelstein is actually a really nice guy but the way that he is able to just play oh this character Steve so well and so gross and slimy oh he's really good in this role um but Steve tells Brent that Brent should actually be grateful this is all been solved and what but that's when we have Brent kind of asking a big question this is kind of like his final test to his dad before he we figure out what Brent is ultimately going to decide to do whether to save his friend or not so in a previous episode we had learned that Steve has some secrets regarding Luke and the death of you know his wife Steve's wife and Luke's mom in that car accident we just thought that Steve blamed Luke because Luke was the one that needed new cleats and that was the car accident but we have Luke also blaming Steve because Steve was the one who was supposed to take Luke to get those cleats that night and bailed so Luke's mom had to do it and there's this whole accident they were blaming each other but Luke hinted that there was this other secret <clears throat> well now we know what secret Steve was hiding Brent asks Steve if his mom had been drinking the night of the accident and drunk driving, and that is what caused the accident. And it turns out she was, and Steve have it, had it covered up, saying that Luke had distracted her and that caused the accident. So you can imagine that, that there with also just all of Steve's anger at Luke in the first place and that guilt and the blame, that really took a toll on Luke. And while Steve admits to covering up that part of the accident, saying that Steve didn't want her remembered that way, and so he uses power and privilege to cover it up to protect his family, to protect his image, because his wife causing a drunk driving accident would have just obviously been a bad thing for Steve's image. Learning all this makes Brent go down to the police station, get the sheriff to let him talk to Megan, where Brent confesses everything to Megan about how he is the one who killed Luke. Brent went to the woods, to the dock to get Luke. They started fighting when Brent was like, ribbon on Luke again, pushing Luke too far, and Luke trying to say that he's not like Brent and Steve. But, and well, some of you guessed it in a previous video that Luke actually meant to grab one of Brent's naughty tapes to expose Brent at that Christmas party so that the golden child could not be the golden child anymore. And maybe Luke could get some steam taken off of him. Uh, a lot of you guessed that that's actually what happened because it was Luke in Brent's room just grabbing a tape. And that is actually True. Luke says he grabbed the wrong tape that night, accidentally grabbed his and Megan's tape, and that just pisses um, Brent off, causing Brent and Luke to fight. Brent pushes Luke. Luke hits his head on the metal railing for the steps into the water, falls into the water, and of course Brent thinks that Luke's just playing around, but by the time he jumps into the water, it's too dark, and he can't find Luke. But one thing I'm wondering here about the tapes is why on earth would Luke film that tape and then store that tape in Brent's collection just sitting on top of all of those tapes and how did Brent never watch it? That just seems weird. I would think that Luke would keep that tape so safe. So safe. That's just a weird little strange thing that happened. And also how Brent knew to ask his dad about his mom being drunk was because Luke brought it up and also that helped cause the fight. So then Brent explains to Megan how Steve tried to cover it all up and put the blame on Ned or Isabella and how Brent is the one who planted Isabella's backpack in the cabin and stuff. But ultimately Brent thought this whole thing can go unsolved but now that he knows it's falling on Megan and Megan is his friend, he is fessed up, said that Luke really did love Megan and apologizes and is of course handcuffed and we do see some justice served as Steve sits in his house in the dark and the police show up banging on the door to also arrest him. So with the culprit behind bars, what happens to Megan and Isabella? Well, we see that the Chambers family scandal is basically running front page news, of course, including the questions surrounding the car accident and death of Steve's wife and the boy's mom. Megan finally hears back from neighbor Ned, who's kind of been MIA and I would be too, who informs her of a job offer from a friend that needs a, you know, a programmer to start immediately. So we think that Megan's kind of getting her happy ending while she may have had her scholarship revoked because of the whole tape thing getting out finally that she was the one on the tape. 
you know, she's got this job offer and it's probably going to be a pretty good one. We then see that Isabella herself is on a flight back to Ibiza where she meets a new girl on this plane and they start talking and Isabella raves about her year in Chatham saying her best friend Megan is super loyal and stuff. Oh, this girl's manipulation. And man, but when this new girl named Michelle says that she's never been to Ibiza before, it is Ibiza, right? Ibiza, Ibiza, whatever. Isabella is like, um, well, this place can be tricky and you should really have a partner in crime and she offers to be a party guide for Michelle. But here's when you know something is messed up, the twist, because the name Isabella introduces herself to as to this girl. I'm Lisa. Oh, watching this, I was like, how dare this woman ruin my name? First, she is obsessed with the best friend with my name, and then that person magically dies, and now she is just taking this girl's name. Can we retroactively go back and have her take somebody else's name? But, you know, this is just foreshadowing the twist that comes at the very, very end of the episode. We think that that would be a good place for the show to end, right? It really leaves you open-ended of like, okay, well, both girls seem to have gotten away with the stuff that they did because there was a bigger fish to fry. Well... Instead, we have Megan going to the dock to say goodbye to Luke, and she notices something shining in the trees, something that apparently they have never noticed throughout, even though they know that Ned has cameras everywhere. Megan realizes Ned has the security camera pointing right at the dock the whole time. So after hearing everything that Brent has said, she kind of wants to be like, okay, let's just go look if that's true. She hacks back in to look at the footage and pulls up the view from New Year's for the dock. And what does she find? She finds that after everything that Brent said happened, Luke somehow survived and made it back to the shore. But who walked up upon him late at night that night? None other than Isabella, who is indeed the one who killed Luke by looking around, making sure no one was watching her, putting her foot on his head, causing him to drown, and then pushing his body back out into the water. We then end with the season with Megan crying after what she's seen and staring kind of into our souls, leaving us to question what happens next. So yeah, just like season one, we're left with a lot of unanswered questions, probably intentionally and also some unintentionally. Like season one, it's revealed sort of that everybody had a part in something. Ultimately, Isabella is that one who delivered the actual death blow. Now, one difference we have here between season one is in the season one, when we learned that Jeanette indeed had known that Kate was in that basement and ignored it and left her down there, that was a secret between us and the audience, or us, the audience, and Jeanette. Public didn't know that. No other character knew that. This time, though, Megan indeed knows the truth. So now you have the question of what is she going to do with that information? Does she want justice for Luke and take this footage to the police and they try to track down Elizabeth? Well, or Isabella, sorry. But she lives, the thing is, like, Megan lives in this rinky-dink town. What really can that police department do? And is it big enough case to get, like, FBI and guess everybody else involved? They left it so we don't know the whole story also about Isabella's path and what uh, past and what truly happened with Lisa. So has Isabella now gotten away with murder maybe twice? Kind of seems like it, right? Will Megan choose to just leave everything alone now that she's gotten a chance to have probably a great job and she'd be able to take care of her family and they can just let it all go. But her friend is also now in jail. Just like season one, both Jeanette and Isabella did get their reputation and name drug through the mud, but ultimately Jeanette got her name cleared, her five minutes of fame getting <clears throat> to go back on news and having a an apology from Kate and stuff, while Isabella just flat out got away with it and fled the country. So what do we know? We do know this is an anthology style series. This also, the way that this ended, they could continue with this story if they really wanted to, depending on how they want Megan to handle the situation. Or like I said, they can leave it open. So we just have all these questions that we can sit here and wrestle with the moral dilemmas, just like we did with season one and debate it and talk about who was right, who was wrong, who was all wrong, who was the worst wrong, you know. But let's get to some other unanswered questions. What happened between Isabella and Lisa? What was on that floppy disk drive or whatever that Isabella kept with her that said the summer before? I'm guessing that's either just some happy memories because she was obsessed with Lisa or it could be collateral, just like uh, how uh, Isabella kept that tape and then re-edited it so that she could pin it all on Megan. Maybe that's what that disc is, something that she could keep in her back pocket, the ace up her sleeve for if something with the Lisa case came back to bite her in the butt. Why did Megan clean the cabin after Luke's body was found? Like, it all happened in January. Why was it July when she decided to finally go clean the blood off the floor and take the sheets and stuff? You know, wouldn't have police investigated there first. Well, it's like now knowing that 
Brent and Steve knew what happened that night and wanted to pin it on the girls. My guess is they just left that cabin completely the way it was so that if they did go investigate the cabin, um, the girls could have their prints everywhere. It could be traced back to them even though they didn't know maybe exactly everything that happened that night. But I'm still curious why the police didn't go there because you would think they would lead them right there to the cabin. I, there's still questions there that I'm like, I don't think that whole thing wrapped up right or was told right. At one point also when the girls were at the bar with their fake IDs, they saw the sheriff passing something off to another guy in the bar and it seemed kind of shady. That really was never answered about what the sheriff was doing there, but my guess is that was just to show that the sheriff himself maybe isn't as stand-up of a guy as we would like for him to be. Then what about Megan's pregnancy and such? Well, the showrunner did do an interview with TV Line after the finale aired to explain a few things that like the pregnancy and stuff. So let's see what the showrunner said. So the showrunner L. Treadman said that Isabella didn't go back to actually kill Luke. She explained that Isabella goes there to talk to him and try to reason with him and get him to stay out of Megan's life. Now this, I'm gonna interrupt here with this answer for a second because if you look at the tapes, Isabella goes back when it's pitch black. She is still wearing the same outfit she wore when we see Megan and Isabella come back in the morning at like 8 a.m. when it's light outside. Um, so, if, you know, that means that Isabella had to go back out into the woods that same day, but at nighttime after everybody's happened because there wouldn't have been enough time between when Steve was out there and when they went back in the morning, I don't think. So Isabella had no not knowing that she was ever gonna find Luke. She must have just thought that he was hiding somewhere and she just got lucky when she saw him in the water there or something. I don't know, but saying that she had the intention to go try to talk to Luke and reason with him, like, I'm not sure that I buy that. L, the showrunner, continued to say to, you know, that she went there to try to get Luke to talk and to get him to stay out of Megan's life. But then she was presented with him basically half dead, and so it was one of those snap judgment in the moment situations, and she decides that she, the only way to ensure Megan's future at that point was to kill Luke. So when we had Luke's solo episode and we saw that through his eyes, Isabella was more aggressive towards him, telling him to basically stay out of Megan's life and that it wasn't actually the case of an unreliable narrator because of that shift of point of view. It actually seems that maybe Isabella was that aggressive to Luke. We just never saw it quite that in our faces. It was a little bit more subtle throughout because we were seeing everything from the girl's point of view. And, you know, Isabella was just so much better at hiding it from Megan what she was saying to Luke behind her back for the most part. But yeah, I just guess that Isabella got very lucky when she went to go look for Luke again and Luke unfortunately got very unlucky. Now when it comes to if Isabella was always going to be the killer, killer Elle says they tossed around names like Debbie, the sheriff, Brent and such, and I know we all tossed around names, but they ultimately landed on Isabella, which kind of makes sense why some of the storylines with Debbie or the sheriff and stuff were just never fleshed out. Like they were started, then kind of immediately abandoned. And it was just like a little branch that kind of started and then went kind of like how Pretty Little Liars felt like they changed their mind midway through many, many times when it came to who A was. Kind of felt like that happened a few times throughout this season. As far as what Megan is going to do with the knowledge that she has after seeing who really killed Luke, Elle said that she thinks Megan would take it to the authorities so Brent doesn't have to spend his life in prison, but the question is still open of will she try to go after Isabella herself. Look, I know what Brent did was an accident, but that kid does need to spend a few more nights in jail for what he did as far as having no remorse when, when it came to the tapes and filming girls. He just needs that wake-up call, but also we just really need to leave Steve in jail because that man is a menace. As far as Isabella changing her name to Lisa in an ending, the showrunner said that it's just Isabella reinventing herself and getting a clean start again. And I guess that sort of makes sense because we do have Isabella going back to Ibiza, the place that she fled from and probably is wanted for questioning. So her changing her name would make sense so that, you know, people don't immediately recognize her. But also why is that the place she is choosing to go back to? Like, is there some reason that she has to go back to where the scene of her last friend disappeared from? I mean, sadly, we don't get any answers for if Isabella was responsible to what happened to Lisa. And it seems like, according to the showrunner, it was really never something they thought they'd have to tell us. They was just gonna leave it open-ended and open to interpretation. 
And as far as those bloody sheets, she does confirm that those were the sheets that, you know, Luke, we saw Luke get shot on the bed from. They were not from the pregnancy. But what about that pregnancy, right? They just kind of like had that announced and then it was dropped and never really fully discussed about what happened to a baby. Well, the showrunner says they just decided to chalk that up to it being a false positive. And well, here's a few other excerpts from the showrunner's interview about a few other things you can read. I don't know if the showrunner's answers to some of those questions are that satisfying, but uh, you know, with a show like this, I guess you're never really gonna get all the answers that you kind of want. It's just gonna be everybody kind of just coming up with things on their own, but I really did want to know what happened with Isabella and Lisa, right? But we, we learned that Isabella has basically just craved the family belonging and she gets very attached and she gets so attached that she only wants the best for that person, causing blindness and whatever is in the path that could upset the best for her person, they have to be eliminated and that's just ultimately what happened to Luke. But it does seem like in the end, Megan will maybe be happy. She's got a programming job or whatever and but both lives, obviously, of these girls are changed forever, at least maybe Megan's, because Isabella doesn't seem to have any remorse or conscience or whatever. She just is moving on maybe to her next victim. But now it's up to you as the viewer to form your opinions. I really want to know what you think happened with Isabella and Lisa. Now knowing what Isabella was like in this whole season, do you think that she could have done something to Lisa? Or do you think that that was maybe truly an accident that just sent, sent Isabella off the edge and made her want to get so attached to Megan to not lose another friend? What do you think would happen now that Megan knows what she knows that Isabella did to Luke? Do you think she would actually give it to the police in the rinky-dink town and hope they do something? Or will she use her hacking skills to maybe like get vengeance, track down Isabella herself? Or is she just gonna let it all go? What do you think she would do? Overall, in my opinion, this season as a whole, I don't think it was as strong as season one, but it was still interesting enough, especially at the last few episodes of the season were fun and intense. I kind of wish it had kept up that pace all season. The one thing I did miss in season two that season one did was show us both girls' point of view. The way they flip-flopped from episode, one episode being Jeanette's to one episode being Kate's and back and forth. I just thought it was interesting to give us a more better view of both girls' thoughts and points of view that you really were left kind of questioning the morality of both of them until the very, very end of who was truly, you know, guilty because both girls left things out and whatever, and it was their interpretation of the other person and such. You finally got a point of view shift with Luke, which really did give us that other view of Isabella. But I just feel like if you, we did overthink this season a lot, it, uh, you know, in the comments, we sat and overthinked. I know we should have just from the start been like it was Isabella. And I know a lot of you did just stick with it. You're just like, it's Isabella. But they did throw quite a few red herrings in their way that did have us making other theories and stuff. But ultimately, we should have just guessed it was Isabella because it was like right there in front of us this whole time. But now that we have wrapped up this season and talked about some of the explanations and what the showrunner said about why they ended things the way they did, I gotta know, what do you think about everything that happened this season? What about the actual ending? Did you predict it all, even those little, little twists there? And um, what do you think should happen? What does Megan need to do with that tape? Should Brent get out of jail? Should he stay in jail? Steve should definitely stay in jail, right? Um, yeah, what loose ends do you wish had been tied up? And what storylines do you maybe think should have been handled a little better? And if there was a season to follow the rest of this story, what do you think should happen? But if the show does get renewed for season three and instead they keep it anthology and go with another story kind of in the same, obviously, vain theme as what we've seen, what kind of story do you think they could go to next? Let me know all your thoughts and theories on everything down below. And after that, you can obviously check out more of my videos right over here. And I just want to say thank you to all of you who hung out with me all season, especially season one, two. I hope that these videos make sense because I realize I just get to rambling and sometimes even my thoughts don't go in the right orders. And sometimes I think I repeat things or don't touch on things I want to. But um, thanks for listening to me ramble. If there is a season three, I will be here. And as always, I'm Lisa and I guess I'll see you next time.